Hi, my name is Jonathan Lynn and Chase. I'm an artist living and working, um, born and raised in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, I live here with my husband and our three cats. Uh, I'm primarily a painter, but I work across different materials, including sculpture, video, and poetry. Um, my um, work is in all types of collections, public and private, including the Rebels, the Hordes, um, High Art Museum, um, the Whitney, and also the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And um, thank you for uh, tuning into this talk with me and my close friend, Devin, and um, I hope you enjoy. Bye-bye. Hi, my name is Devin M. Morris. I'm a visual artist out of New York City. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I'm excited to do a talk today with Jonathan Linden Chase for their show, Big Wash, at the Fabric Workshop Museum. What are you up to? How are things? Um, I've been painting this morning, um, did my meditating, did my emails, mm -hmm. really trying to um, unplug from like, um, not necessarily social media, but like the news. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've been trying to do the opposite. Um, I never plug into the news, but I've been trying to unplug from social media very heavily this year. Um, I don't know. I think as far as like psychosis and just different mental things, I don't think it's like a safe space um, for me, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Like um, every once in a while, we'll get someone kind of, I don't know, just being like random or like really aggressive or something. Um, I've been kind of like getting more comfortable kind of like I'm um, showing like my actual body in my work. Mm -hmm. So um, just like this like weird ass fucking white man like just kind of came on to my shit like being fat phobic and I'm like whoa why are you even following me? Yeah it's like so weird. <laughs> so definitely That's like true. I don't know just getting sort of um, space away from um, that kind of negativity and um you know just like everyone's kind of um i don't know 2020 is like just unlike anything um a lot of us has experienced before mm -hmm. yeah. i was thinking i was thinking um in regards to our conversation i love how your show is titled big wash and 2020 is the biggest wash we've had <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, whoa just such a um it's been a hard one um beautiful i'm so happy for like the raised consciousness as a collective society um i don't think that that consciousness has been easy for everyone mentally and um but i think that's a part of the growth or balancing that we have to like exist within so i'm um, accepting of wherever we are uh, as people yeah, absolutely. I think a lot about how like change um, isn't promised to be like smooth, right, or gentle. Mm -hmm. And I think with this, all these energies and complexities going on that like it really is like pitting us in the middle of it and like having just to kind of deal with like where we're at just mm -hmm. the best way that we can. Yeah. Right. Like right. I know a lot of like um, MAGA people were whatever, just like asshole people, just to lump them all up. Um, they're really saying like, oh, like the world is coming to an end, like our world is being threatened. And I'm like, well, fuck yeah. Like we're trying to like get rid change of it. like this shit, right? We're trying to change it. So in that way, I'm like, you are correct to be afraid. <laughs> and it's so funny because like, that's what I've been telling people. I'm like, we claim we want change. You yeah. must know that change means discomfort. Nothing yeah. about change is, uh, is there like some like form of um, transition where it's just so peaceful. I mean, like, look at the foolishness that's going on right now in Washington. Um, we decided to have that. And so it's going to be hard to get out of. Absolutely. I was thinking a lot about um, for, I think the company gallery did like a series of like kind of online things. And I remember mm -hmm. seeing, um, your performance piece you were um doing like a lawnmower doing some like washing and i just like yeah. really love your video work a lot oh my god thank you i mean you know it's so funny because like <clears throat> some of the early video stuff like i sometimes have trouble uh owning it you know like that i made it or that i make it and like that it exists um even though i love genius and i think the genius of everything and every creative and is that it is that things exist not you know so um 
when I did the company thing, I've been thinking a lot about like how not to prove my work and to just do the ritual or do the work. Um, and so they were like, you know, this is opportunity. And I'm like, well, this is where I'm at. I need to clean my objects, which is, um, you know, my, in my practice, I find a lot of found object. And in some ways I'm an archivist and I'm in relationship to the, um, to the bodies that have, you know, existed and have uh, dealt with these objects before they became naturalized and put in public. But um, as I bring them back in for redomestication, I thought, well, what would it be to like wash them now? Like as they've been dirty by rain and by dust and dirt from the street. Interesting how you said like redomesticating. Like, do you feel like, um, like when you like come into objects, do you have like a sort of like, um, do you sense like energy embedded into it? Like, is that a part of the washing too? Like mm -hmm. all of the memories and mysteries of like the journey of that particular object? It may be in, a, uh, in an honoring way of honoring the people who come before um, me with that object and how I work with them is to clean it and to kind of like reprop them up, reprop up that existence, that Americanness, um, because that object came from like this American structure. Uh, but yeah, sometimes when I see the object, I rarely am sure, I'm sure what I want to do with it. I was on a train on my way here to Philly yesterday and I saw a, a, a door that's been like degrading for years on a pile of like old tires. And I was just like, it made me want to cry a little bit. Mm. And so I was just like, I want that, you know, I wanted to bring it closer. Um, recently I've gotten a studio and I got a, a storage unit. And I was like, I, I there was this thing that happened where I can kind of make work more freely now because I'm not being yelled at by the objects. They're like, you right. said you were gonna do this with me. And I'm like, I know, but I'm like. <laughs> 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 so they do have a presence and they, I don't necessarily always know why I'm drawn to the um, object. I, I think I've learned more through um, that. And interestingly enough, like with my video, um, in a similar way, I, I see that like in your Wild Wild West show, you kind of turn to video a bit, which I feel like has always been kind of natural to you, some form of animation. Um, and then also in this show, you have the um, homebody. Yes. I wanted to like ask you about how you felt about uh, the rituals of, um, I, as I look at it, life practice, which mm -hmm. um, then we're like dealing with like the interior of the home, the exterior of the home. For me in my life, that was a who was doing the ritual from the inside, who was doing the ritual from the outside. Um, yeah, how how uh, important is it to you the the processes of domesticity? I always like tell people like um, my mom's like sort of like my first introduction to art, kind of like my first art teacher, if you will. Mm -hmm. I used to like draw all kinds of like um, domestic things. Like her kind of creativity kind of stems from. Um, like interior design and those kind of things. So even from just early on, just like watching my mom, like just do like these rituals and just kind of thinking about what they meant to her and what they could possibly mean to me as, you know, kind of like my journey into like adulthood. Mm -hmm. And like, I think especially now just thinking about, um, you mentioned um, archiving, which um, I'm interested in too. For me, I think um, thinking personally, um, it's a way to um, kind of calm nerves and to kind of centralize yourself. So by that, I mean like my mom is always talking about um, if you think of like your, your house or your living space as like an extension or like this other self portrait of you. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like if your mind is feeling crowded, you may have like um, an organ an unorganized space. Getting sort of um, more personal to myself, um, I was diagnosed living with bipolar in 2011, and up until that point, it was sort of like a really a struggle to um, be mindful, right? Because mm -hmm. I didn't know what was going on, so through um, thinking of my home as like a body for myself and maintaining it, um, kind of coming into that diagnosis kind of really helped me get an understanding of um, what scheduling and balance means for me. And then also trying to like navigate how, um, like we're talking about change, um, like entropy, how it is always like liminal and changing and moving much like our bodies. Right. And so for me, like these rituals are a meditation for me, like mindfulness, keeping me from um, 
at times even kind of dissociating um, mm-hmm. from my body, right? It's to kind of keep myself planted and grounded. Um, so thinking about a home where, let's say you're feeling blue or depressed mm-hmm. on the spectrum, um, you may have debris in your home, like food you haven't discarded. Um, you might not brush your teeth for a while. You might not be showering. And on the other spectrum, um, having like a high energy or a mania, um, that's what I deal with, like uh, manic depression. So I go through periods where I have lots of energy. Um, I don't sleep. Um, you feel invincible and just really happy. But then you can also kind of feel irritable or just kind of like, um, it's like a train flying off the tracks. So um, for me, that can look like a variety of things and everyone is different. And and like my rituals, like um, like I do like sort of things like um, email cleaning, um, kind of like balancing my mind, doing dream journals, um, like talking to people, this act of like reconnecting um, with people to kind of find myself through it. Thinking about just look at like my family and like our genealogy and stuff. So. Uh, my aunt's like 63. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of like a situation where growing up, we always kind of would say she was a light switch. And um, she lived into my grandma's house. We would notice that she would um, accumulate lots of objects. She's very much into specifically um, paper and kind of like VHS tapes, like magazines, articles. So um, my aunt's not diagnosed, but like in our family, we're kind of aware that she probably is bipolar and thinking about cleaning and maintaining of the space. um, I think for myself, like when I'm working, everything is kind of around, it gets messy, but then it's complicated too, because I'm an artist. So it's also my nature. A few things to start. Um, Domestic care, domestic life work. I've been thinking that uh, okay, so for one, I used to inaccurately um, align that work and that lineage of kind of like training to this post-slavery thing where we needed to keep our houses clean. And that was like the biggest installa- installation of pride for us um, in society was like how cleanly we could be. And I do think that that's partially a part of why we live cleanly. But as you're describing this, and this is what I've been thinking about recently, is that um for mental well-being, and that's like another reason why we care for our spaces in the ways that we do, why we care for cleanliness, because it does help us align with peacefulness and also align with our body and like who are we at this moment. Because in similar ways, I felt the same from my mom. I knew what was going on. Not uh, she didn't necessarily have um, she wasn't bipolar, but she I, there was ways that I knew how that she was communicating through her um, actions of cleanly being clean having us been clean on one day doing things like that and then also um i've been thinking like how that is a form of ancestral uh like um, ancestral like knowledge being shared so Mm -hmm. in ways where you could uh these things are being shared so that you know more deeply how we kind of traditionally done things to recenter ourselves and rebalance ourselves um yeah, I think I'll, I'll think about that a lot lately. In your email, you said you wanted to talk about like black racist um, domestic cleaning up, cleaning uh, yeah. products. And there's like so many of them. And just recently, just in my research, um, places like in China, they still sell like products that um, have like black faced on them and are like really just like like um, propelling this like. Bad. I don't even want to say it's like an image of this because they're not real, they're characters, but what they're interpreting is um, blackness and darkness being dirty. dirty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, there was someone like um, laundry detergent, mm-hmm. and it's really interesting how um, they focus on children. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not, sh- I'm not sure why, but um, like they'll have just like, kids like sort of standing in like a basin of water or something and the packages themselves usually kind of have like yellow or orange colors with like Mm -hmm. um 
like uh, older typeface kind of reminds you of like Western typeface or something like that. Yeah. Which almost feels like bounty-ish, um, slight antebellum-y, like yes. uh, all these ways to say I hate Black people or I will continue to um, publicize the idea that hate of Blackness should be uh, prioritized. It also makes me think about Lonnie, um, Lonnie Johnson, because he made the Super Soaker. There's, there's a simultaneous uh, element of your work that we all love, um, <laughs> and that's the queer relationships that you um, expose through your work and also the personal, like, reflective relationships that you expose of yourself. Um, and I was thinking, like, a Super Soaker kind of, like, speaks to, like, the joy that I get from that exploration in the work, uh, if you could speak to that. Thank you. Yeah, like for me, it's really important to show bodies that are at peace, at rest, and at joy. Um, especially thinking about like um, the history of like um, lynching and postcards and how our images are like circulated around and um, they're literally um, consuming like our trauma and pain. And I think about um, if you think about, let's say, like popular culture, cinema, stuff like that, mm -hmm. maybe in some cases, um, uh, fine art that um, really kind of talks about one part of our stories, um, which is like pain and grief and violence usually at the hands of whiteness. So for me, it's like, um, I make work for queer and black people, like, mm -hmm. I, there are no white, like, there's whiteness doesn't have a place in my work. So for me, being the center of your own narrative um, is a way to, like, just take pride and joy in, like, your body, your existence, the spaces that we make um, to our ancestors. Um, yeah, things like that. Um, just, like, Fast forward to now, you know, like social media, like we were just talking about, you'll just see like, um, I'm always just kind of like stop sharing videos of this being killed. Like yeah. <laughs> that doesn't help anything. And if anything, like a lot of people like spectacle and sensationalism and all of like this stuff. So it's not really doing anything. It's just more people consuming um, our pain. As I think about like a, a way to, I describe something that you were speaking about as far as like showing the full um, range of the black experience is black atmosphere. And so I'm never interested in the edges of an idea. I'm always interested in that center. And so like, that's what I feel like your work does. And you create an atmosphere as opposed to one idea that like needs to be addressed. I think you work so seamlessly throughout so many mediums and looking at the installation and big wash, like what, how did you come to that? Like, also, how did you just come to this idea of exposing the wash? Who did the washing in your house? And was um, was your laundry at home or did you have to go out? <laughs> we would kind of just like take turns. So I am doing the best with my husband to like provide and take care of like my family. I'm an only child. And, you know, um, from not coming from money, it's not like, oh, you can have a house and you can have a house and you can have a house. So it's really like a system of, um, uh, some kind of breaking apart certain rituals, and in this case, like laundry. Um, our laundry mm -hmm. machines are in our basement. Um, we are new to being dryer owners, um, so that's pretty um cool. Um, I just remember growing up, um, like we would hang like our clothesline um, in our basement and just let things dry that way. And um, like we had like a, a small sort of area where we had some grass. And we would string it up there to get like that nice, cool elemental air. Um, yeah, that was like um, my grandma's kind of thing too. So mentioning my grandma, um, mm -hmm. a part of what made me kind of go into this idea of like Big Wash was, um, so when Rider takes place in like 1999, um, and that was like around the time I came out of the closet. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like really, it was just really traumatic, right? I was brought up in the church. I'm mm -hmm. not so sure I was baptized. Right. So you're in this space where you're supposed to be love, protection, nurturing, but you're sort of like um, 
for me, I was kind of like camouflaging into like this one role I was taking. And at the same time, you're an abomination. You're going to hell. Like, so they're talking about literally you, but not realizing that they're talking about you. Right. <laughs> um, and then at the same time, like outside of me, um, thinking about um, Y2K, mm-hmm. simultaneously, like um, my grandma used to watch evangelicalists just all the time. So like church was Sunday, but then through the week, she just was like watching like all of these like really um, kind of negative like pastors talking about the end of the world. So I was like young at the time, and this was all very scary. This right. notion of the outside world um, being destroyed with technology and then sort of like, I haven't even like fucked yet. Like I'm a virgin and I'm being told <laughs> I'm going to hell just for my desires and Your thoughts. Yeah. My thoughts and desires. So big watch um, is like uh, more into like my teenage years, um, like really kind of like, experiencing like my body and like spaces as like kind of um living more openly so big wash is sort of like the post-apocalyptic me kind of washing and confronting maybe some demons and some lingering kind of like traumas that i had and um it's like coming out of like this like big bomb that went off and then kind of um recalibrating yourself, um, purifying yourself with water. Um, water is a huge motif in my work. I think about it for like emotions and then of course purification, biblical kind of things. But yeah, um, that kind of like got me into the show. And then um, thinking about just like, my work has a lot to do with like um, friends um, and family, um, non-blood related mostly. And just like our shared experiences like venturing out into like um these spaces where our bodies are often um like going through like this grid so like there's like um the laundromat part where there's like a checkered floor um black and white thinking about like the outside space um of a laundromat um so um it's really fun being in a laundromat because there's just all kinds of like people in there yeah some people are chill people are like um just like they just seem like very um peaceful and relaxed um just kind of taking care of like articles of of clothing so it's like they're bringing pieces of their identity with them in the shared space and we're all there just um this is a part of our routine um it's really relaxing yeah um there's yeah and that's it's just such a private and public place um so personal so uh yeah i love that i go to i i live in new york so i go to you know i go to a laundromat um growing up it was similar we had in many different houses there was typically uh, um what is it called a uh, washing machine in the basement but not often a dryer um right whereas then i look at my grandparents house who always had a washing dryer a few cars you know like that was like this other thing for me um but I learned so much in that travel, right? That travel, going to the space, how early I was taught to wash clothes, um, thinking about all the rituals of living and how that prepared me in ways, like thousands of ways where once I got into the real world or, in, or the adult world, I was able to kind of prepare, uh, take care of myself. Um, mm-hmm. Speaking about belief, I was wondering how that like exposing hate within the spiritual like realm how did that like shape your future spiritual practice yeah that's that's a that's a great and really personal question thanks for asking it so um i was baptist up until probably 17 Mm -hmm. um so like a year uh I, i would say actually more like 18 but like um, so I came out when I was like 16, like 15 going into 16. And okay. so I had been always interested in like um, the occult, right? This mm-hmm. kind of thing about like uh, magic in different ways and this kind of like 
thinking about how they always say, well, if good exists, there's evil. And I'm like, why are these things that we don't know about or understand um, deemed that way? And I think it's like lots of reasons, like fear, mm-hmm. lack of like just education or knowledge, um, people seeking to protect you from just mm-hmm. like things that they think are not good for like your soul. Um, so I became really interested in like magic and stuff and I was practicing Wicca around that time. Um, more sort of like historian, just like kind of like reading lots. Uh, and then I met my best friend, um, Eric, who you met. And yes. um, our bond, one of the tender things about our bond is that like we kind of brought um, different things to the table, just learning about um, baptism and um he's um atheist or was i think he's transitioning on himself too and so for like a long time um i just was kind of like i don't know why someone like myself would be created by a god who was destined to be damned and there's like these right these conflicts of like um like logic like this thing that don't right make sense and that was a large part of me just like wanting to um learning how to like not um hate myself and like earlier just like progressively going into agnostic and now at my current age i'm 31 um i'm learning more about like yoruba traditions and like ori and stuff like that just getting more um into like our spirituality and our yeah and our ways of being like on like astral planes so that was kind of like my trajectory i wanted to love myself more i wanted to like not be like held sabotage to someone's limited way of um existing so it went from like anguish to like anger um and then i think like strength yeah mm-hmm. and importantly the need to be curious I think religion kind of like um, kills that, mm-hmm. you know, like being inquisitive. And right. yeah, me and you as artists, like that's a part of what we're doing. We're always asking questions. So it just kind of like it, it just contradicted and like didn't fit for um, it. Then with my fantasy. <laughs> yeah. I love, I love that grief cycle you kind of described just now for yourself and reimagining how, um, I'm not reimagining, but like just learning more deeply about religion and or um, spirituality and how it could like serve you more, um, choosing yourself. Also, uh, where was the, like the first places you access queerness? So I, I know for me, like I played a lot, like I got my aunt's computer taken from her because I was like looking at like the gay apps or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't an app. It was looking at gay websites or whatever. And then, you know, aim why I Yahoo Instant Messenger because like ain't nobody I had to use Yahoo, Yahoo Instant Messenger because nobody had <laughs> um internet. So it was like, you know, I had to log in through different people's memes. But where did you first um access queerness or like a gay culture? Definitely, definitely um us both being older than Google, which is weird to say. Um, right. Ah! <laughs> The um the internet had a lot to do with it. Um just like reading, exploring, getting connected with other people, um, all kinds of people. Um I think like I was a little sheltered, probably just because like I am the only one. So like right. I it. yeah. And I think in addition to the internet, um like uh i'm like a huge like i'm a nerd so um i'm really into like comics um i'm a marvel fan kind of person um anime and manga and just thinking about like what people will call like black weirdos or like geeks and nerds um i think was like one of my early indications of like um i am at least very different from like my straight counterparts in that way in terms of um interest like i wasn't really into sports and stuff i was more Mm -hmm. like a homebody more stationary with my body um just really kind of feeding and like flexing my brain and my imagination um so i think every black kid um 
whether it was like passed down from like our parents, like Kung Fu flicks and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and I think like for us, like um, Dragon Ball Z, Sailor Moon, um, these ideas of um, the characters would transform into something. And um, just like the ways that um, like American comics, like X-Men, for example, like born out of, you know, it's, it's pretty much mirroring uh, uh, Malcolm X and Dr. King. Like, you know, these two like, very polarizing people who have ways of dealing with um, hatred and genocide projected on, in this case, mutants who were like the outcasts. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what really resonated with me that they had a very, not until like the second generation, they kind of got more diverse, but just um, different kinds of people coming together for a common goal and just how they were, um, thinking about the body in these ways that um, I think for me really questioned um, the binary uh, early mm -hmm. on. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's actually a dope way to like <clears throat> kind of expose um, one of the uh, one of the elements of how that could work, like how our car teams helped us um, find freedoms that society wasn't like necessarily interested in yet. Um, I also think about like black magic domesticity so like yeah. like which object or uh in the home do you find to be the most transcendent oh oh my goodness um i work with ovens a lot so mm. for me it's this very complicated morbid but nourishing object mm -hmm. and just the relationship to um literally you're putting dead things inside of it you're um baking things ingredients combinations of things you're looking at books um recipe books like spell books um or just like word of mouth passing down like recipes and stuff and um at the same time it also makes me just think of just like how you know like uh we're flesh like we're vessels mm -hmm. um, fortunately i guess for us humans um our creativity and um arguably our intelligence allows us to um evolve in a certain way um because like let's face it we can't really do anything it gets like a lion or a bear right mm -hmm. so we're still very um fragile like we're flesh we're meat um not to get too far into like food chain kind of stuff or whatever but um no, definitely. yeah but like like the like the oven um i think of this like um like a body and um how um yeah like different things go in and different things um go out let me see so i love the uh the two washing machines in your show at, <clears throat> at the fabric workshop and museum um how does it feel to be like in your now body your now place and to be able to kind of like you know I wouldn't say deface, but maybe mark these objects and they become more, um, they become more like a gold chain almost for me. Cause it's like, I don't, you know, owning a washing machine and a dryer is like such a hard thing to do. Um, and you're able to kind of transform them into these art objects. Like how did that feel? So um, most of my sculptures are um, either soft or from found objects. So I'm like kind of like finding like the right thing that kind of resonates with me aesthetically and taking it and kind of like thinking about it as an extension of like my paintings and thinking of like haptics, like sound, um, the five senses, taste, um, touch, sight, and thinking about how like, um, in this case with the washing machine, it's kind of like, um, this uh body um how these things kind of like erupt out of it and also kind of keep a memory on it at the same time so there's like um different like kind of like waves of brush strokes there's some collage there's like some uh, poetry text on it so for me it was like a three-dimensional surface but it was also flat but then also something that could act maybe as like a like a portal um a body at the same time um i'm always like with every um like with every show or like kind of like event there's like the space tells you certain things and i worked on site 
um, on it. And um, yeah, I had to really just kind of think about what that gallery space was asking of me and the object and kind of mm -hmm. balancing this middle ground of like my desires and wishes and what the object kind of embedded kind of like um, was asking of both me in the space, if that makes sense. No, definitely. And, and it's interesting because as I look at the black and white tiles that make up that space, the clothesline that hang and like the soft sculpture that you have there, which I want to talk about as well, but it leads up to these two um, laundry machines that feel to me almost um, and how they're handled and where they're placed to be almost like royal and like kind of, or even like, maybe male female because of how they like it's like this is happening in front of it and i'm like i love that that kind of uh relationship um and this yeah like that's it feels so like you know almost like the living room you know a lot yeah. of times I'm, it, that feels like the living room it's like the two chairs um but like also like your uh the patterns that you made for this show because you worked on fabric a lot so they were called to me like Ankara and like different African like fabrications. Were you inspired by those when you made your? <laughs> yeah, I was inspired by like um, like those and um, particularly um, early 2000s fashion. Mm -hmm. Thinking about like um, sagging as like this very, um, everyone has like their um, opinion on it as mm -hmm. a style. And like I right. think um, getting like there's like like a history of it like you really can't get like one type of take on it so for me it was like a symbol of um beauty and joy like one way mm -hmm. that um a body in this case like male presenting bodies can um uh present their body in a way that's comfortable to them um mm -hmm. with clothing and pattern and um like uh the sort of platinum to it so i was looking mm -hmm. at like underwear and thinking that um see i i don't like straight lines right <laughs> so i wanted it to um it's a no <laughs> yeah oh like i i i just can't <laughs> like, <laughs> i love them <'em. laughs> thank you i i wanted to have like a um thinking about the fabric itself and how it moves and bends and wraps around something and also thinking about like the grid of the floor being very um precise right and then like this plaid inspiration and like patterns like um for me it was like i learned a lot like i think of printmaking it was like a silk screen mm -hmm. and like, the many processes of it like the layerings and then the uncertainty which made me feel uncomfortable because it wasn't as immediate Mm -hmm. So like the sort of lines that are um, the pattern in it in a way that I wanted to kind of compose like the flowers and the butterflies to me was a way for it to be more um, free, like flying and floating. And um, that's the way I think like um, the body wants to naturally be. It doesn't want to be constrained or confined, whether in like, um, like a box or someone's like construct of um in this case what's fashionable uh like i think a lot of times when you think about sagging it's like respectability politics mm -hmm. that center around it more um, like these right. stereotypes but for me um it's less about that and just like um the celebration of like that 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 icon that like it's in like so many mundane kind of like places whether um the laundry mat, a person that you know personally, a porn video, a music video. It like it's just like I walk down the street. Mm -hmm. You know, you're speaking about the boxers and sagging, and I've been wearing them, but the screen pen pattern that we're discussing and through it, they're sent out, the boxes are sent out to different users, and we are able to like journal um while we wear them, which has re- entered me into journaling and has helped expose like a very vulnerable place that I needed to get mm -hmm. back to. And I think that's often, again, for me, why I can't deal with the internet, because maybe I'm not being personal enough with myself. Um, but I really love that experience of wearing the boxers and they act as the as this portal that feels window like 
Um, also sex and desire. And for me, you know, I've been thinking a lot, well, period. I think we both think, and you showcase a lot on your Instagram, like your inspirations and like how we see that, that part of the male body, um, sometimes as desirous because I mean, it's exposing something that as a queer body you might enjoy. Um, and yeah, so I, I love that element of it. And then, um, I think so much about like how uh, men are comfortable with exposing so much of themselves with yeah. this veil. Yes, <laughs> like literally like this piece of fabric that like separates something that for, if we're talking cisgender heterosexual men, mm -hmm. um, it, it just seems to like contrast. It's interesting to me that um, one of the most vulnerable parts of the body, one that, you could consider maybe cleavage of sorts. It's yes. just like that's sort of way right from being exposed. And it's just fascinating to me. <laughs> it's, it's almost a window into that part, that into that part of our bodies and like in the ways I see how you don't um like straight lines and like that makes me think of curtains blowing in a window and like, like all of that. Like that's and then there's the jiggle all of that like makes me think about that area um and i was happy that you uh pinpointed it with with this ex exploration of these boxers which is funny because we're supposed to journal <laughs> about it as we dirty them um and i love that what are your things like let's talk about fleeting so like yes yes <laughs> preparation um because that's one of the big things of how we exist like we have to prepare ourselves for uh at times for sexual pleasure yes. and to me the longer that you're in a relationship one of the titles of your pieces is um this cry for is uh let me see two films married to books <clears throat> and i'm thinking about the version of that so two films married to books two men at night um two people who are off like let's say to marry people that's usually your will and that's to me speaks to a certain level of intimacy uh where that intimacy doesn't exist i have to fleet more where that intimacy does exist and there's um time stamp and there's language over time of our existence there's less of a need to fleet as i learn my body more and a relationship to our like sexual practices um, couple anyway how do you think about this absolutely i love that you said that like the sort of um the volume of intimacy and then the relationship to another person and knowing your body um i think it's like really beautiful and some things i was definitely um thinking about like one of the things that um like thinking about like image making a reflection of like um uh queer bodies male male bodies presenting bodies is um uh, fetishization and mm -hmm. like the black, um, the black dick, right? And, yes. Oh gosh. <clears throat> all right. So I'm like, um, penises enter my work, but um, in a way that I try to make them um, relaxed, um, uh, desirable, soft, um, like as you know, it's usually like erect or something. And for me, those things are like. At times can be like sensationalized and like mm -hmm. really kind of like um pushes like the rest of the body back and then like the interior like the mm -hmm. the essence of the person mm -hmm. so for me um i'm like i like to like in my mind right be like i'm a verse bottom but i'm more just a bottom um <laughs> also but that speaks to the uh volume of intimacy we yeah. all birth bodies want to be together for too long. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's like a matter of time. For me, I'm interested in talking about the experience of um, bottoming and, and bottoms that I think mm -hmm. um, more people seem maybe less comfortable about in certain ways than they are with something that they are more kind of familiar with, which is like a penis. Right, and what it does exactly but for me like the sexual energy um that i'm talking about is um the beauty and like the honoring and the desire of um being 
entered in and being penetrated and not even in a um, submissive way. Cause I think that that's something that automatically is sort of labeled onto it. It's like this um, passive role. Right. It isn't true. Yeah. That isn't true for every case. Um, like thinking about fleeting and like my daily ritual around it and even um for the sake of like getting ready to do sex and then there is something just like warm hot water inside of the body feels good as it does as you're taking a shower Mm -hmm. yeah it can like i think nurse away aches and pains um it can some me some people makes you feel fresh some people you know even if they just want to sort of masturbate like the penis doesn't even have to be a part of like that that moment mm-hmm. <clears throat> i think a lot about like how you frag fragment the bodies in your work um and how they kind of like become worlds right there might be a butterfly that's a butt that's a the that you know and i think a lot of times it seems like people are not interested in identifying with the vulnerable position. I do understand the ease that comes from popping because you're just going in. And I, I, I remember early on in my sexual practice thinking like maybe <clears throat> it's easier to say you're a top and be a top because you don't have to like also be emotionally entered. Mm. Whereas there is a big energy exchange in mm. that. Also, if you like raw and there's a lot of, you know, like to me, I think about that. Like if I go through a moment where I'm having sex for too, like too much, I'm like, okay, I've accepted too much energy. I need to clear, um, yeah. which the fleet then like operates in a different way in that way too. Um, but yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. How do you look at sexual agency within your work? Like, it seems like you're often very close to um, portraying some forms of vulnerability and um, memory through sex sexuality. Yeah, like I think like the vulnerability is something that um, I always try to go for like what I consider honesty. So, mm-hmm. um, for example, um, I think there's uh, six days a week. There's so many titles I can't remember them all, but it's like a sculpture, and there's mm-hmm. um, house. And there's like um, like a beauty mannequin head. So mm-hmm. for me, that's like a representation of the body. In this case, like a laundry mat. And the towels were used for um, six days and they just weren't washed. Mm-hmm. So it consists of just like bodily fluid, like piss, cum, sweat, shit. Like, so for me, like just reminding ourselves like similar to like flesh, and like the other one we were talking about, like um, being just like a, um, a living like creature that, you know, sex is like, um, it's messy. It's gross sometimes. Like, you know, we're like these bodies that are always constantly sweating, um, shedding our skin. And for me, like in my like own sexual life, like kind of identifying as like a top for a long time and thinking about the topness as a way to preserve and maintain my masculinity right, uh, right. and um can i ask a quick I, question yeah yeah was your, was your first sexual experience um queer sexual experience uh, as a top it was actually um as a as a bottom but mm-hmm. me and a person i was with at the time um ultimately we didn't work out of course but um, at the time, there was friction because of like, um, like not wanting to, and that's why we didn't work out. We didn't want to be um, completely vulnerable with each other and to mm-hmm. kind of like take this moment, which could potentially have been a journey to explore ourselves through each other. So um, it's just like really kind of putting in a space where I'm like, I really do have to like, get in touch with like my sensitivity my my empathicness realizing that i am more of a um emotional connection than i thought right access intimacy is like a recent <clears throat> terminology and um, field of study i've been reading up on i think about like how over time you figured out that like intimacy being sensitive 
probably heightens the experience, right? And it heightens. And I realized that through hookups um, and through everything. Also, like the first time I had sex, I was I bottomed, which I always imagined I would. I mean, I growing up, I'd be sitting in the tub reading books, being like, you know, I just imagined I would be in that role. Um, <clears throat> but I bottomed it. With, it sucked. But uh, it, it, after I was done, I felt like I had lost um, my manhood. Yeah. And and that was only because I heard people say if you, you know, have gay sex that you, you know, you, you, that's what it does. And I'm like, and I remember feeling so guilty and so down, like, I didn't know I had a manhood prior to that moment because I don't, you know, it wasn't a real no. thing, but um, that was the limit that I placed on myself. And I continued on to date that person and like think that I was in love. And like, I think that's the greatest learning for me as well. Um, uh, Cause I access care really well. And through like, that's what we've been talking about a lot is care care isn't love um that's a reckoning that i think over the last as i as i am a caring being whose work and the environments that i create center care that like there's a responsibility of love and that i have to understand and define for myself how that plays out um but yeah we were in a caring thing but it wasn't necessarily a loving situation i look at care as being intergenerationally the element of communication that happens. Um, so like for me, my grandmother probably would never apologize to me or have a conversation with me like I'm an adult. But, she, oh my God, as I say that, uh, um, my mom calls. <laughs> but- <laughs> Her ears are burning. <laughs> I'm like, ah! Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, intergenerationally, my grandmother would never have a conversation with me that would like actually be like one of agency and like accountability, but she might make me spaghetti because she know I like spaghetti or might make me lasagna or clean or like, or come in the room and be like, I'm gonna clean your clothes before you go home. Something like that. And yeah. that's supposed to smooth it over. How uh, how did that play out in your life? Because I know that so much of your life is from my grandma. Oh yeah, definitely. My grandma was the same way. She um, would, apologize or be transparent in this way more so than my mother so like when i first came out it was very traumatic tumultuous um just like we weren't understanding each other and it was just like not good mm -hmm. but <laughs> even outside of that just like maybe a disagreement or if she's crossed a boundary she's very hard to kind of like rest her ego and talk to me as an adult Mm -hmm. um about just sort of taking accountability for certain things in her way like i i know that she loves me dearly without mm -hmm. a question mm -hmm. but the way that she handles her emotions is different from me and this would look like um i made you dinner um i got this ready for you so you didn't have to worry about it um this always checking on me so those were like her ways of kind of like showing and not necessarily telling. Although I think that the power of speaking something into space is also very helpful too. Yeah, I think so. Um, <clears throat> I actually had a dream last night about like having a very honest conversation with my grandmother. Um, I think we lost our grandparents, our very formative grandparents in the same year. My granddad was 2018 um yeah and, my grandma yeah i think he was june 15th because i was actually working on a painting about, about like the rituals uh, outside the home that he would um do as i got the news um and i just titled it after him but <clears throat> i had a dream last night about like speaking to my grandmother in a way that was honest and like my granddad was like in the background I was, that's how i know i'm like really connected when he shows up because like i feel like we're very connected um yeah, I wanted to make a land acknowledgement as we're like on like Lenape native land here in Philadelphia. And I did a uh, meditation series recently, meditation yoga series, where the first one was um, based around like us realizing that we are also native to our bodies and that our bodies are our land. Um, and I think through your work, you, uh, seek to do that and like seek to see that as a process of um, understanding self through like being more native to yourself. 
Um, and I really appreciate that in your work and like all that you do. Um, I think it's so thoughtful. We're lucky, and you know, and you and you make books each time. Like you know, maybe people don't know, but like every time you show a body of work is also from a a body of um, accumulation that you like painstakingly put together and just thought through. So like I just wanted to acknowledge all that. Oh, thank you so much. Like. I always love talking to you and I, you know, think about you like a lot. Every time I see a chair or when I brought a table into my studio, like I always feel like you have to sort of connection through art and like both being queer black, you know, bodies mm -hmm. uh, and like our shared love over the, the, the domestic and kind of tapping into that, that power. And like mm -hmm. your work is just like so rich and like, material and it's so cathartic that like i love the show that you did at um company like it really like made me feel seen and welcomed and um and affirming in ways like just working in like these variety of complex modes and materials that i think um you're interested in just like we're well, not just but also just like the complexities of like existing and that that is okay mm -hmm. exactly like that's the point <clears throat> because we exist so we exist so like so much like stacks of everything that we experience so yeah. it's like if you if you're not open to all of it then you probably are like somehow traumatizing yourself um so it is okay it is okay to compile it all and to grab it all and to like, you know, work with it. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my gosh. We feel like going forever and ever. <laughs> I know. Like, I'm like, we can just keep going. <laughs>